from Alden. We've both been here a long time, and I remember the first time I met you. I had just arrived. I was in my office in the English department, and you just popped your head in and, and welcomed me. What year was that? Uh, that would be 76, I 76. think. 76. Yeah. You were just on your way up to your third floor office. I don't know that I had made my way up there yet. And uh, anyway, I just appreciated that and just thought, ah, a friend. So what drew you into the ministry? You come from a family of doctors. You could have gone in many different directions. What drew you into the ministry? That's, uh, that's a tantalizing question. Um, on the surface, it could be because I couldn't stand the sight of blood. <laughs> so this uh, moved me away from a medical endeavor. But I've always had a, a very deeply religious experience and a curious experience in that it, uh, while I'm very devout, I'm also a very curious person. I've often said that if I were at the burning bush, for example, I would immediately take off my shoes. But then as soon as possible, I would ask, how did you do that? <laughs> and that sense of curiosity doesn't, doesn't mix well, actually, with worship, often does not. See? In fact, one of the reasons why I probably put more emphasis on memorization of scripture for devotional purposes is that uh, I have such a curious streak in me that if I start reading the scripture, I chase this rabbit, and then that rabbit, and then that rabbit, and that's not necessarily a devotional focus. So when I'm memorizing something, it's something that I want to focus on, and that gives me more of the devotional strength that I need. Were there any early experiences in your life that helped to shape you, to direct you towards ministry? There were three incidents that happened when my folks were missionaries in Medellin, Colombia. Um, and I remember two of them, especially because I can remember hearing my mother tell these stories. Um, one was when we were coming back from Bogota, the capital, to Medellin in a plane, a little DC-3, and the weather closed in, and there was no place to land. And uh, our pilot was in a deep ravine going back and forth from one side to the other. There was a raging river down below. He finally spotted a, uh, a little sand spit down there, and so he landed on it, and the props cut into that. By the time the rafts arrived from nearby mining camp, the spit was entirely closed over. The water was raging so high. Um, to think of what God had done that point, as I heard my mother telling that story, that made a deep impression on me. And then the other one, I got trench mouth from eating too many mud pies, probably. And uh, my throat was swollen, I couldn't swallow. And they had special prayer for me at the church, and God intervened. Mm -hmm. So with that lurking in the background, there's almost a sense of destiny that God has a special place for me. I very could have easily just have disappeared, but uh, God apparently had work for me to do. Yes. Um, so you, of course, became a scholar uh, as well as a minister. And how, how did you combine the two? What influence did Walla Walla have on you uh, in shaping you as a scholar with the heart of a pastor? Well, that's a very interesting wrinkle because some people are driven to do more scholarly work in scholarly journals, whereas my work has been almost entirely for church papers. Uh, that's not something that I sat down and decided to do. It was just something that uh, seemed to be the thing to do. But I have a very strong interest in ordinary people um, and uh, am firmly convinced that the church needs to provide a place where very simple people and very sophisticated people can worship together. You use prayer a lot in your classroom, I know, um, very effectively. Can, can you talk about that a bit? Well, I like to have the first class period of the week uh, where I take prayer requests, but we're so afraid to be put on the spot. You have to be in a place where you can be with people who pray. 
but you need to feel comfortable there without having to feel that you have to pray for yourself. So in morning worship, you never have to pray. Um, we never put anybody on the spot, but you can be with people who do pray, and I think that's a step in the right direction. You not only speak to the scholars in the church, you write for all audiences, uh, different audiences. Well, the, my initial writing was done for signs of the times, and I focused on scripture there, so it had a biblical focus. I wanted to establish my credentials so that if I had to tackle more difficult topics, I would have the rootage there in biblical narrative. And I have written for almost all denominational periodicals. What led you to the book Inspiration? I think it was driven by the needs of my students and class. Um, when I was working on the finishing touches on the book Inspiration, I was on sabbatical in Scotland, and I stopped by the office of one of the Old Testament professors there. He's a devout man, but a liberal Christian. He asked me what I was doing, and so I told him I got sick and tired of students losing faith in the Bible when they found things in the Bible that they didn't think were supposed to be there. So I decided to write a book that made perfectly clear those things that never change, the one great principle of love, the two great commandments, and the Ten Commandments. After that, you draw a double line, and everything else beyond that illustrates and applies that in time and place. Without missing a beat, he says that's exactly where the Bible draws the line. And he turned me to Deuteronomy 4, 13 and 14, and it was almost like having an Adventist Bible study right on the spot. Deuteronomy, I have my students memorize this now, by the way. Deuteronomy 4, 13 says, he declared to you his covenant, which he charged you to observe. That is the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two stone tablets. Notice he says, you can't tell this in English, but in Hebrew it's to all the people, you all, you have to say if you want to declare it. He declared to you, all of you, his covenant, which he charged you to observe, that is the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two stone tablets. So you talk to all the people, you call it covenant, you call it commandments, and he writes it on two stone tablets. Then the next verse he says, and the Lord charged me at that time, not all the people, but charged Moses, Lord charged me at that time to teach you statutes and ordinances. Notice the change in vocabulary. It's now no longer covenant and commandments, but statutes and ordinances. So as you're quite right, he says you just draw a double line, everything else like that illustrates and applies that. And that really has been my concern because I think there are enough frightening things in the world without people being frightened of their Bible. I knew what it was like in my early years to be a little bit afraid of turning over a page for fear I might find something that would bring my faith crashing down. And I didn't like that idea because I'm a very devout person. I didn't like the idea of losing my faith. So that's probably where inspiration got started. What do you do to recharge your batteries, to refresh your spirit? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, during term, I became I'm involved with morning worship, mm -hmm. where students, much more than faculty, uh, we have six, eight, ten students that came not for worship credit because they like the experience, or we meet there and sing and so on. So that is an important motivated for me. But I also uh, do a lot of memorization just to provide focus. Uh, that is a, a good nurturing one. And then mm -hmm. what I do in my devotional experience, I read through various translations looking for something that I can write out by hand in a book, and I can take it up and then we read it together for breakfast. But that's been a very interesting experience when you come to Scripture asking, mm -hmm. what is it that will feed my soul today? It throws an entirely different light on things. So that exploratory thing is, mm -hmm. is a nurturing aspect for me because I'm also thinking of Wanda's experience, and she's a very gentle person. The dedication, you may remember this in my little book, Who's Afraid of the Old Testament God, says, dedicated to my gentle wife, Wanda, who still does not enjoy reading the Old Testament in spite of all my arguments and explanations. <laughs> what would you say that your idea of a best day looks like? A best day? Yeah. Conversations that involve people who are deeply interested in matters of religion mm -hmm. and in explorations. Um, if it's a good idea to go out for a walk, too. Um, we've been back to Scotland now, I think, 17 times, and there are beautiful places there. We just got back this spring from another trip. 
So uh, a combination of walking and talking. In my case, it's a world of ideas and a world of people. So if you're going to have a perfect day, you need to have some of that. <laughs> I think you have the gift of encouragement. And what is it now that gives you hope for the future of the church? Well, one of the things, and this is a strange way to look at it, but if you read either the writings of Ellen White or scripture, you'll discover that God's people have never had their act together for more than a few minutes at a time. Uh, Fritz Guy has a great line where he says, hope is what you do when you don't have enough evidence to be optimistic. So, uh, and there's a passage in Romans, which is wonderful, for in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So I live in hope. As you've lived your life as a theologian in the Adventist Church and uh, here at this university, what have been the particular joys and struggles of that profession? Well, the joys are being a community where you have colleagues uh, that you can actually discuss things with, where there's room for diversity. And it's an unusual campus that has that because most other campuses are torn apart on theology. Either that or in some cases they have almost nothing to do with one another. But uh, because we are isolated out here in the wheat fields, um, you know, four hours from the nearest known sin, you might say, <laughs> we have our own community here. And I don't think that we ought to be afraid of the hard questions. In fact, uh, one of the book titles I'd like to write is There Are No Problems in the Bible, a high view of Scripture without inerrancy. If you take a strong note of condescension, God reaching people where they are, if we could see where the people were and what's, how they thought and how God was thinking about them, it would make perfectly good sense. Our problem is, we think God should think like we do here, but uh, I, I appreciate a place where people can, can, can search, ask questions, but there are many in the church who find that very difficult to do. Alden, before we go, is there anything you would like to say to your former students? That's a dangerous question. I find myself getting just a bit emotional at it when you ask it, because I would love for my students to have faith, to have hope, not give up on the church. It's so easy to give up on the church these days. But when they leave this place where they may have a lot of friends, worship experiences, but they go out in the sticks where there's nobody, they're all by themselves, uh, it's, it's a real challenge. Yet uh, it's important for me that my students maintain their faith, learn to grow, and I would love for students to stay by, to be tenacious, not let anybody chase them away. Thank you, Alden.